Hello and welcome. This is Lorenz for Create a Learning Site. And this time it's a little different. I have here the English translation of a presentation I did in Munich in January of 2016 in German. The topic was the end times with a special focus on God's glory. Once upon a time, the late great planet Earth you see the German version here, was a highly successful book. Uh, if you're old enough, you may remember it. It was the best-selling non-fiction book of the entire decade of the 1970s. Worldwide, 35 million copies were sold. Today, it's no longer relevant. Uh, if its author, Hal Lindsey, would have been right, the world would have ended 30 years ago. Some of us would not have been born. The reason it's no longer relevant is in this quote. Many books about biblical prophecies are like yogurt. They are quickly past their best before date. So, did we learn something from this experience? Well, the September issue of Create a Learning Site last year dealt with end time speculations around the so-called blood moons. This issue was by far the most successful to date. This illustration shows the statistics for September. The weekend before the last lunar eclipse in a series of four, there were hundreds of visitors each day. The accompanying YouTube video uh, with more or less the same content was visited more than 300 times. Now, in comparison, the month before, uh, I wrote on Leviticus, seven reasons to read this book. This video was watched 11 times. That includes the times I watched it myself. This, although Leviticus has the potential to change our lives. I'm not sure what the blood moon can do for our spiritual growth. I guess we would rather eat at McDonald's than make, make ourselves a healthy bowl of salad. A well-known Bible verse states, the grass withers, the flower fades, yogurt goes past its best before date, but the word of our God will stand forever. Well, okay, uh, one of those four is not in the Bible. But many end time theories, like that of the blood moons, belong in the category of yogurt and grass. It seems we did not learn anything from the experience of failed predictions. On the contrary, we may have moved backwards. Herr Lindsay was at least trying to interpret scripture, even if, in my opinion, he did not do this well. Uh, the excitement about blood moons over the past two or three years was not nearly as rooted in the Bible as Herr Lindsay's book. As a quick reminder, the blood moon thesis is based on a sequence of four full, complete, lunar eclipses in 2014 and 2015. Each of these took place on a Jewish holiday, Passover and Feast of Booth. And this was taken as a sign that great and significant things were about to take place. So, what is the biblical foundation for this thesis? Now, if the blood moon thesis finds support anywhere in the Bible, I would expect this to be in Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, and in its original in, in the book of Joel. So let's read this. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Okay, so far so good, that's familiar ground. But then it continues, and I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, Taking a thorough look at this passage makes us realize there are problems with the blood moon thesis. Peter believes that this is happening now, 
in his own time, almost 2,000 years ago. And a lunar eclipse is not a wonder or a miracle. And there's no mention here of four or of Jewish holidays. It does not say there will be four lunar eclipses on Jewish holidays and then something important will happen in the world. Now, the signs listed in Acts 2 accompany something of great significance, yes, but for salvation history, a real turning point, but a turning point that was hardly visible. There were some people in Jerusalem acting strangely and speaking foreign languages. That was it, to the natural eye. Now, the last line also describes something that was true back then and continue to be true until today. It's not about something that will one day, still in the future, begin to come true. In other words, the Blood Moon thesis goes far beyond the text. Something was constructed that doesn't have much to do with the Bible anymore. Notice that this passage not only speaks of wonders in the heavens, but also of signs on the earth blood, fire, smoke. Many interpreters believe that this kind of language in the prophets is not intended to be taken literally. Uh, it's a formula that points to significant turning points or events in salvation history. These may not look spectacular to the natural eye. Now, <clears throat> there are those who disagree and believe that there has to be a more literal and visible fulfillment, but then it should at least be considered that this passage must then describe something considerably bigger and far more dramatic than what happened on 28th September last year. Surely Acts 2 does not describe a lunar eclipse or four. Francisca and I really wanted to see the eclipse, so we got up at 4 a.m. that morning. We were in the south of Spain, which is known for its many cloudless days and nights. However, when we came outside, we saw nothing but clouds. So what kind of a sign is this? We could not even see it. Let's face it, there is hardly a more harmless natural phenomenon than a lunar eclipse. When it comes to the end times, our aim should not be to read signs in order to come up with a prognosis or a scenario. What will happen next? How much time is left? Experience teaches this does not work. This is why all their end time books are no longer in print. They failed. And if we concentrate on this, we will miss more important implications of this subject, the end times. So if it is not about reading signs, what is it about? Well, among other things, it is about living differently. That is something we talk about more often. And it is about God's glory. And that is something we don't talk about so much, especially not in the context of this subject, the end times. Perhaps we are too preoccupied with ourselves to recognize that it is really about God. Both in English and in Greek, the word and can also signify the aim or purpose of something, rather than merely a sense in a, a temporal sense that something stops. Well, it makes sense. It's a sad end if the goal is not reached. So what is the goal? We find it in Ephesians 1. In the first half of this chapter, Paul presents us with an immensely dense summary of God's plan of salvation from beginning to end. And in this, he repeats the phrase, to the praise of his glorious grace, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory. So, in the end, it's all about God's glory. The obvious question is, what does glory mean? The English word sounds beautiful, but it is a bit vague. We tend to associate it with concepts like light and radiance, beauty and splendor, greatness and power, and honor. All these concepts, to some extent, overlap in meaning with glory. 
Especially interesting is the Hebrew word that can be translated as glory, kavod. Its primary meaning is weight or heaviness. So, how heavy is God? Well, the question does not make sense. We cannot put God on the scales. Weight is a subject in physics, but God is not physical. When dealing with God, the term is used as an image, a metaphor. If we realize that, the previous question, how heavy is God, can be answered. He is infinitely heavy. Maybe you know what it's like to experience God's presence. It's a profound sense of lightness and heaviness at the same time. One of the first events in which God's glory revealed itself in a dramatic fashion was on Mount Sinai. Thunder, an earthquake, trumpets, fire, smoke accompanied this manifestation of God. This may be the reason that later manifestations of God are described in similar terms, even though they may not have been as visible. Shortly after this, the glory of God moved into the tabernacle in the form of a cloud, and several centuries later, during Solomon's reign, it moved into the newly built temple. This line runs straight through the whole Bible. God's glory desires to come to us. He wants to share it with us. At the end of the Bible, therefore, we find a city beaming with God's glory and presence. However, the glory of God is not only a phenomenon that manifests itself from time to time. It is also something that, in a sense, is always there. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The seraphim in Isaiah 6 proclaim, the whole earth is full of his glory. Present tense. At the same time, it is a promise, a desire, a prayer. Psalm 72, may the whole earth be filled with his glory. As God's glory becomes visible reality, it fills the entire earth. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In other words, God is continuously on the move to bring his glory into this world. That is his end, his ultimate final goal. His glory is present, it manifests itself, and it will in the end be fully realized on earth as it is in heaven. So already and not yet. That's an idea that will look familiar to many of us. God has clearly announced that this is what he intends. Isaiah 40, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And then we read a few lines down, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. At the beginning of the Gospels, exactly these verses are quoted. There can be no question about it, the voice in the desert is John the Baptist. And we know, therefore, what is to come next, the revelation of the glory of God. And what came after John? A man named Jesus, the son of a construction worker. Not long after his public appearance, he was cruelly executed as a criminal and a rebel. Is this the glory of God? A man who dies on a cross? Yes, this is the glory of God. This too is what glory looks like. No one is stronger than the one who has power but does not use it. No one is mightier or more glorious than the one who does what serves others. Sacrificial love is the greatest glory that God reveals. It surpasses, greatly outweighs the glory of Sinai. This is the glory that will one day fill the earth and the universe, so that, in the verse of 1 Corinthians 15, God will be all in all. Now that we have understood the concept of God's glory a little better, let's revisit that other point, living differently. How could we do that? 
What does that mean? We are still dealing with the subject of the end times. This photo shows start and finish. Now, finish does not mean this is where it stops, because every end is also a new beginning. <clears throat> and in this picture, start and finish coincide. But what if the new beginning precedes the finish? What if the old is not yet finished, but the new already gets on the way? In that case, we end up with overlap. And it's the situation we find ourselves in. The starting shot has already been fired. The start is behind us, even if the finish of the old world is still ahead. This makes us new people called to carry the new, God's light and presence, into the world. In the Old Testament, there was only one place where God's glory dwelt. In the New Testament, there is such a place in every location where there is a church, where Christians live as Christians, where someone loves God. End time means the new has already begun. We reveal God's glory and carry it into the world. We do so as broken vessels. None of us is perfect yet. Sometimes the disabilities are obvious, sometimes less so. It's the less obvious ones that often are the more problematic. God builds his new creation with the broken pieces of the old. We are carriers of his presence. This reminds me of the legend of Christophorus. His name means Christ bearer. Christophorus was a strong man who became a believer and he wanted to do something. So he was told to carry travelers across a certain river. One day a child appeared that he also carried a cross and then the child revealed it was Christ and gave Christophorus his name. Now, we don't carry Christ outwardly across a river or anywhere else. But what would it mean to carry him and his glory into the world? We have seen that glory stands for light, beauty, power and honor. Light is a metaphor for truth, but also for purity perfection and what's morally good. Theologically correct is also important, but it does not in and of itself give life. We are called to be a light in this world. Beauty has plenty of ugliness in the world and it does not lead to God, except perhaps as a contrast pointing to its opposite. We are called to make God known through the creation of beauty. Power, not in the sense of pure strength that can destroy or enforce its will. This is a liberating, restoring, healing kind of power. The power of love and forgiveness. Restoring is far more difficult than destruction. Anyone can destroy, even the devil. But to make someone or something whole again, well, that's a skill that only God fully understands. Honor. We are called to give God glory, in words, but also through our lives, by living differently. So this is our calling. Light of the world, beauty in the world, power that heals. And all of this to the praise of his glory. What is something you could do to make more room in your life for God's glory to shine?